Hello, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of NetApp Insight 2024. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, alongside my co-host and analyst, Rob Strecce. Rob, it's an election here in, here in the U.S. We're not going to talk about the election, but no. we're going to talk about the public sector. Absolutely, and I, I think it's also an interesting time because it's the end of the year for the public Last sector as well, for the federal, exactly. at least. So this is perfect timing to perfect. have somebody on to you know, really dive into what does all of this stuff we're talking about mean for public sector. So. Indeed, indeed. Well, I'd like to welcome back to theCUBE, Michelle Rudnicki, President, U.S. Public Sector at NetApp. Thank you, and thank you for having me back. Excellent. Well, let's get started. Why don't you start in broad brush terms and provide an overview for our viewers of how, how federal agencies are using NetApp to really streamline their operations in order to make better decisions, quicker decisions, and, and, and bring more efficiency to yeah. the very large, sometimes <laughs> slow moving <laughs> government. They are, they are all very large organizations. And so, you know, what we've seen with our federal government, much like a lot of our customers, is that, you know, they've had to take advantage of cloud and other things, right? So that their infrastructures are becoming more and more diverse, right? And that means they've got data here, data there, and uh, where NetApp has been able to help them is to really cross those silos and bring an intelligent data infrastructure that they can take advantage of, you know, whether they're in the cloud or they're working on-prem. So, uh, we see a lot of that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we heard it yesterday, and I, don't, I think it was George who said it, that uh, some of the more regulated industries are really embracing uh, really AI, and, and maybe they'd been sort of left behind in some of their digital transformation, they couldn't get there, but AI seems to be playing a bigger role, and you know, AI doesn't live without data. So how, how are you seeing AI and the decision making and driving that decision making inside the public sector? Yeah, so of course our government officials and our government agencies all want to make the best possible de decisions for their citizens and, and our public. And so um, they're looking at how do we use, utilize AI. And when we're talking to a lot of the agencies, one of the biggest struggles they have is we've got data but it's a little fragmented, and in order for us to make the best decisions, we have to, we have to be able to get that data together to be able to take advantage of it all, to make the right decisions, to take advantage of AI. So we really see them, they're a little bit nascent on it, um, but we've seen some organizations move, uh, move forward, like Yale University, I know that's in the other part, that's not one of my government customers, but one of our public sector customers, that is using it to help to look at the research and, and move, um, move forward with their clinicians in the, on the medical center. So they're reading the notes and being able to get better insights out of the data that they have. How do you describe the state of innovation within the public sector? There's a new project out of Stanford University called the Digitalist Papers. There's a story about it in the New York Times. Eric Brynjolfsson, a very famous researcher, and he's, he's trying to highlight the need for institutional innovation, particularly for the government, to increase the odds that AI enhances democracy uh, and, 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 and wipes out misinformation or disinformation, I mean, maybe not Completely Absolutely. eliminated, <laughs> but 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 well, how do you view? This? Yeah, and so I, you know, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And, and talking to some of our customers that are here, um, actually, we we're talking with a DoD customer, and they're like, they're, they were listening to the same uh, conversation from George yesterday, and they're like, yeah, we're not, we're just so far back that being able to take advantage of some of these technologies, maybe we can leapfrog and really get ahead of things, right? It's um, sometimes when you're deprived, it's like let's just take the leap, and NetApp can help us to do that, right, by giving us complete solutions, not us having to take all the pieces and integrate it together ourselves. Yeah, and I, I think cybersecurity and cyber resilience and really even compartmentalization and all of those degrees and signing up to be you know, secure from the start, which is part of the NIST and some of the DOD and some of the, that has to help when you're going in to have these conversations and they have to be looking for that stuff. Absolutely, I think NetApp's been a trusted partner of the federal government for over 30 years, so, and some of the reasons that they've trusted us is 
we always have kept security in the forefront, right? I think last year, or last spring when I was talking to you, we were talking to, we just joined CISA, Secure by Design, right? Some of the other things we've done over the years, is we always are testing for government standards and others, whether it's um, common criteria for DOD or ISO standards, which apply to not only our government, but governments around the world. And then one of the other things we did was the um, NSA's uh, CSFC uh, certification, which is the commercial solutions for classified environments, right. where they tested our products to say, it's good enough to hold secret and top secret data, so we'll make this available for commercial companies or for, um, for other agencies so that they don't have to redo all of the testing, so. So IT budgets are tight, that's true in the, the private sector, but it's especially true in the public sector, and, and modernizing legacy systems is expensive, it takes a long time, um, and there are lots of procurement hurdles as well. So how is Net NetApp supporting its, its public sector clients and helping them manage these costs while also still pushing forward and, and doing the modernization efforts that are so badly needed. Yeah, in a, in a couple of different ways. In some ways, we're helping them with the design of their solution. So um, we see a number of our customers struggling with, um, there's been an increase in costs with their VMware by Broadcom uh, licensing. So helping them to re-architect and utilize uh, more efficient solutions so that they can reduce reduce the cost of those bills. In fact, we helped one customer save over a million dollars by just using that app um, in places where they were using some other products and it helped to reduce their overall bill uh, tremendously. The other area that we see is um, in use of consumption-based uh, offerings. Our Keystone offering um, is really getting traction with our federal customers because it allows them to go into an OPEX and to pay for what they want and what they need. So they're getting modern equipment when, in, when they need it on demand without having to have those capital purchases and those big spikes in their budgets. And it would, it would seem that even though the requirements of the, the federal government and like DOD and the three letter acronym spooky guys over there <laughs> in the corner, you know, are, are pretty extreme, it, it helps everybody across that because you know, like you said, Yale still doesn't want their patient data getting right. out and securing it Absolutely. and things of that nature. How do you see everything that you do with all of this works for you know, not only federal, but SLED as well, as you would call it. Oh <laughs> I'm yeah, sure. so, so, and oftentimes, you know, I talked a little bit about that CSFC uh, yeah. certification, and when we first um, uh, publicized that we had gotten this certification, all of the calls that I got were actually from commercial, right, where it was, you know, banks and other things, yeah. healthcare organizations that are like, tell me a little bit more about this, what does this mean to me, right, what did they test for? So. Having that embedded security, right? And then, you know, the other things that actually becomes more prominent in, um, in SLED and in some companies is ransomware, right? Ransomware is, although there are more than enough cyber threats on the federal side, it's ransomware you see a little bit more prominent on some of the other side. So the inherent capabilities that we have to automatically detect, you know, an, um, anomalies in utilization help prevent you know, those attacks. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I always uh, joked about it, but when you think of some place like uh, you know, educational institutions like MIT, where they're teaching people cybersecurity, they have more hackers inside their, <laughs> their own four walls and they have to be very secure. And that must be a, a, you know, a consideration for that, especially in that part of the public sector is, hey, we're, we're not, we're not the NSA and we're not air gapped or you know, these different regions, but we have to be able, the data has to be accessible, but yet at the same time, we have to figure out how to bring AI to it and things of that nature. Have, have it protected and have it protected and available and let's hope we have more white hats than uh, black hats. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully. So let's talk about today's product announcements and, and the kinds of advancements that, that you see as really meeting the public sector's need for reliable and robust data management systems. Yep, uh, it's so I think you know a couple of things, like some of our new announcements from an, uh, from an ASA standpoint is really helping customers who have those 
those big block environments have a product that is designed and optimized, cost optimized just for them. But I think we're going to get tremendous traction with that. Also, um, it's AI ready, right? And so I think having solutions, right? Not just, hey, I've got storage for you, but really I've got an infrastructure, I've got a toolkit that I can have that can help you to get up and running with AI faster or things that are, are definitely of high interest to all of our customers. And I, I would think that, you know, again, the simplicity aspect, and I, I always go back to this with NetApp, just having been here, you know, over a decade ago, and it was always about simplicity from the beginning, and we actually talked to Jeff Baxter about the six S's, and that was one of them as well. It's, right. I don't want to say it's my favorite out of the six, <laughs> but, you know, it's, sustainability's good as well. But when you talk about something, because again, uh, to what Rebecca was saying about budgets and things like that, they can't hire always. They're not they're not paying right. what uh, a bank is paying for their IT talent. How do you see NetApp and the solutions you're bringing? You know, a, like you said, they're skipping and doing AI and stuff like that. And how do you see that? And how do the partners play a role in that as well? Yeah. So from a simplicity standpoint, you know, <laughs> the simplest uh, the simplest answer I can give you. Um, one of the things is. You know, NetApp has always been good at unified storage, right? And so being able to have the same set of tools, um, you know, whether I'm working on files or block or object, right? I can, I can have a single system administrator. And now we extend that not only to um, the on-prem environment, but into the cloud, right? You've got the same APIs, you've got the same, you've got the same things. That drives simplicity across all of my environments, right? And as I said, with some of the AI things we're bringing, it's like, now, it's not, you're not having to do every element of it, but bringing that together with some of the observability and some of the other tooling that we're putting on top of that, again, just helps to simplify even more. How do you see the skills gap in the public sector right now? Because it is an enduring trend in the technology industry, and as Rob astutely pointed out, you're not going to make as much money if you have, if you're a technologist, if you go into the public sector versus, as you said, a bank or a big tech company. So what is the, the selling Point. I mean, is it that Gen Z is more attracted to mission-driven, purpose-driven roles? I mean, how do you how do you see the public sector as, as being a competitive place to work for, yeah, for so, this kind of work? So I think, you know, public public sector, it's always been hard for our government executives to hire people to hire people in and attract that talent. I think there's some um, some really interesting things, right? People go there because they enjoy the mission or a program. Um, when I look at the government, I think it's got some of the most advanced technology, and then it's got some of the the most remote, the, the most uh, lagging. Archaic. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the best word. Yeah. We'll, right? we'll say it, you yeah. don't have to. <laughs> there you go. Um, and so, I think you know, in the areas that are really interesting, people will go for the interest. I think for the, for the, for the rest, I think the government has tried really hard to um, adopt, like post-pandemic, really the remote work and being able to give people the flexibility and, and the lifestyle that they want and the government benefits, right? It might not be pay, but in the long run, right, there's, um, there's a, a work-life balance and some other things. So they're also trying some new programs where um, they are offering some pay bump uh, for certain skills. So um, there, there are a number of things that the government is doing because they know they have to really focus in on um, attracting talent and AI jobs are one of those. They've called out every AI role and they've provided a, a number of incentives that hiring managers can do. Yeah, and I, I think when you talk about the skills gap, there's a lot of partners that you work with in that space as well, I would assume, that help you. They're, they're cleared and all this other oh, stuff absolutely. on the federal side. And, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have a, a, a good number of partners that um, have been with us in the federal space and we continue to enhance the partner um, community that we have. But the partners play a big role in, and look, we're NetApp. We bring, yeah. We bring storage, storage management, but we can't necessarily bring everything that a client needs. And what we find is a lot of our uh, of government purchasers really are buying solutions, right? They need their switches, they need their servers, they need, their, they need everything at once because they're going to go forward and put a solution or a program in place that's going to meet a mission need, which takes a lot of components and it takes those services. So yes, um, our, our Channel partners as well as the systems integrators really help us to make, 
bridge that gap. How different is, are your public sector clients from, from your private sector clients, for lack of a better yeah. word, in the sense of, is there learnings that can take place of here's what we're doing, or is it just so vastly different when you're dealing with the government? So, um, at, in a lot of ways, they're not that different, right? From a, you know, when you get down to the technology, the te technology is technology, right? It's just supporting one mission versus a business. But um, where we see, uh, where we see differences, it's just, how they buy is a little bit different, the regulations around that are a little bit different, and, and some of that's what causes the bureaucracy or the slowness, right, because here we are once again, um, we are not going to have a budget when we hit October 1st. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it, will, it will be maybe December and maybe some months after that, so um, it really requires, you know, if, if I go back, it's a lot of it is around that acquisition and as you said, you know, having partners that know how to work with our customers and help them to bridge those, those gaps with, um, with their buying vehicles and uh, with different ways that we can help the government to make it through those challenging times. Indeed, they are challenging. Michelle, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. A real interesting conversation. I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Strecce. Stay tuned for more of our live coverage of NetApp Insight 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.